Hello and welcome back to Her Sports Six Nations show brought to you in association with Opal, a proud sponsor of Irish Rugby. My name is Jessica Woodlock and I'm joined by former Irish international Hannah Tyrrell to bring you all the latest Six Nations news, discussion, insight and a few laughs on the way as we build up to the weekend's action. Join us every Thursday and be part of the conversation using the hashtag hashtag her sport six nations we spoke last week about our hopes for the irish game against wales and what we predicted would be a tightly contested affair the result a 31-5 defeat against ireland saw a game full of physicality numerous penalties and a very confident welsh side hannah just where did it all go wrong for ireland um, yeah, look, that's a, a fairly difficult question to answer. Um, you know, it was a really tough defeat for Ireland at the weekend and, and one that maybe not too many people expected. Uh, going into the game, I suppose, you know, these two teams would have been seen as being fairly equal and on par, but uh, that result at the weekend shows that Wales are, are definitely um, a step above us at the minute um, and deservedly so. And that all comes off the back of Wales being professional uh, for the last 18 months or so and Ireland having only gotten their contracts in November, you know, have still a little bit of catching up to do. But Wales came out of the block absolutely flying. They looked strong, they looked fit, they looked fast. But a big thing about them was that they were very composed. You know, they were working really well together and they looked like a team that had been around a very long time and that had know each other inside and out. And their set piece was fantastic. Their physicality and aggression was unbelievable and Ireland couldn't live with it. Um, and, you know, that's something that hopefully can change for Ireland and um, you know and they can get to that same level as Wales and that, and that professionalism can do that to us but uh, Wales were worthy winners at the weekend um, you know in nearly every aspect of the game they uh, battered us and you know this week coming into the France game will be particularly difficult for Ireland both having to review that game and also to pick themselves up to, to go again against um, undoubtedly an even better team than Wales So Hannah going back to when the team was announced last week any surprises there for you? Yeah, look, um, I was very surprised. Uh, you know, a couple of changes there. Obviously, at 10, I was surprised to see Nicole Cronin there. I, I'd obviously been raving about Dan O'Brien and how well she'd done. Um, and yeah, I was very surprised at that. But then when I looked at the team overall as a whole, you know, and again, a number of players making their first Six Nations start, a couple of girls, uh, you know, getting their first cap, um, and particularly with Molly Scuffle McCabe at nine, who has played before, but, you know, hasn't maybe really grasped that nine position. Um, it made sense to start Nicole Corona there, just so you have that little bit of experience at 10 to be able to help those inexperienced players around her. Um, obviously, the one that stands out is, is the young side McGrath, um, starting at prop for Ireland, just 18 years of age. Massive, massive surprise to me, but... From what I'd heard in campus that she'd done really well and that she was a strong physical ball carrier and, and almost like a, another little back row and um, you know on the pitch which is great for for those big ball carriers and tackles that need to be made and um, other than that nothing too surprising um in that you know mostly players who've done really well in the summer series in Japan um, and and yeah, look, it, it was a team that were, you know, I'd say very confident going into that Wales match that they'd be able to do a job despite their inexperience. And you mentioned there Sive McGrath. Obviously, for her to come in at 18 years old, scrummaging against a big Wales pack, you can only, I think, start scrummaging at 16. Is that right? So what must that be like for her, do you think? And, and did that have an effect on our performance in that pack? No, look, obviously, our performance was, um, you know, the girls did everything they could to go and try and win that game. Unfortunately, they came up against a, a vastly more experienced and technically better team in Wales at this present time. And you can't blame that on any one player or, or, or even group of players, you know. And uh, the forward pack as a whole, as an eight, were just utterly dominated in the scrum. Um, and in the line out and set piece in general and our physicality as a whole from 1 to 23 wasn't at the standard required and you, and you know Sive McGrath came in you know and there was a big ask for her it's very very rare to have someone you know at 18 years of age making their international debut but clearly the coaches saw something in her and thought that she'd be up for the job you know and unfortunately it didn't work out too well for her or the rest of the team but you know 
uh, for her to be able to step up in that environment and, and do a job was tremendous in itself. But she, she did have a very difficult day at the office. Um, you know, the the Welsh Front Row in particular were were fantastic. And Tupelo, who, who was only 19 years of age, uh, who converted from a back row for Wales, uh, she actually ended up getting player of the match. So just because you're young doesn't mean you're not able. It's just maybe Sive was lacking in that experience in the scrum, as you said. So in Ireland, yes, you, scrummaging only really happens at um, from under 16 level. And so maybe she needs a little bit more time and exposure. And I'm not an expert in the scrum, but speaking uh, with Lindsay Peat at the weekend, she just noted that there may be some technical adjustments and learnings that Sive need to Sive needs to work on uh, in order to improve her game. But, you know, the talent is there and it's great to see we have young front rowers coming through because that's an area where Ireland have been massively lacking depth. So hopefully, you know, she can start to improve her game, learn from that experience the weekend and, and push on and, and play a big role for Ireland for the next 10 years or so. And then we've seen replacements being made in that pack. Christy Haney came on at one point, Hannah O'Connor. Dervla Nickavard came on and she obviously was unlucky with the yellow card, but... She actually made more metres than any other Irish player apart from si- or apart from Sam Monaghan, sorry. What did you make of her performance and those those replacements performance overall? Yeah, look, um I, I again another player I've been raving about all year is Dermanic Rivard. You know, she played really well for uh, Old Belvier, albeit mainly playing at, at the number eight position um in the Interpros, again at the eight position and switching between hooker. For Munster, she was fantastic and, and my player of the tournament. And she did. She did a really good job when she came on, which is a difficult thing to do, I suppose. When Derv came on, um, she was up against a, a Welsh pack that were, you know, already tiring a little bit. Kind of maybe thought that they had the job done because Wales definitely took their foot off the pedal a little bit in the second half. And it led to a much improved Irish performance. And yes, the replacements had a, a big job in that. I just think that Derv brings massive amounts of energy and um, her physicality while she's not the biggest of players brings massive physicality she's great over the ball her footwork for a forward is fantastic and I think her versatility is fantastic and um, she came on as she was listed as a replacement hooker came on as a flanker at number seven uh, and then ended up the game on the wing you know and she has that bit of speed about her and um, it's not a great look to have you know, your replacement hooker essentially ended up on the wing uh, from an Irish perspective overall. But, you know, Derva's fantastic. She's one of those who has massive heart, uh, that never say die attitude. She's really, really hard to bring down. She has a background in um, in martial arts and uh, she uses her body weight um, really, really well and a uh, great balance. And uh, it'll, it'll be interesting to see, does uh, Greg, you know, bring her in from the start this week? And if he does, where does he start her? Because I think Neve Jones, you know, has been one of our best players uh, of the last couple of years um, for Ireland at Hooker and, and you won't want to be changing her out there. So I think she did really well. I thought Christy Haney did well when she came on and shored up the, the scrum a little bit. Um, you know, again, just has that little bit more experience, was captain of Leinster last year. Um, and, you know, Hannah O'Connor has been around a very long time. Again, just bringing that calmness and that, that experience and just let's let's take a minute here and take a breather and, and settle things down a little bit. And the second half was a much improved performance. And, you know, and, and I think that's the kind of positive side to the analysis that Ireland will be looking at this week. And you mentioned there Dervla Nickavard obviously going over to the wing. We've seen other changes. Nicole went into nine at one point. Molly went on to the wing. What did you make of that 6-2 split that Greg McWilliams went with? Obviously, we didn't have, you know, that multitude of backs to bring on. Yeah, so usually when uh, coaches and teams go with the, a 6-2 split on the bench uh, for their replacements, it's usually because they feel like the game is going to be really physical and attritional and that they could use that extra um, weight and power, um, you know, in the in the forward pack during the game and that that's going to have a massive impact in the second half. And um, it's... A tactic that's not used very often um, and to be honest I can't remember during my tenure uh, in the Irish women's squad going with the 6-2 split on the bench but usually what it means is that you opt to leave out one back uh, and in this instance Greg decided not to go with a replacement nine on the bench which is a very technical position you know and very few players can play that position very well um, and you know, he did it because he had someone like Nicole Cronin starting at 10, who in her 
uh, former years as an Irish player was a nine. So he knew that he could split and change that around. And so the goal would shift to nine. Dan O'Brien could come on at 10. And then he had Vicky Irwin on the bench who covers back three and centre as well. So his, he had the versatility there in his backs. Um, and it gave him the opportunity then to make the changes um, and positional switches when he felt was it was necessary. Um, it kind of backfired, I think, for me in a little way because most of the, the injuries and, uh, that we saw were for backs in the matches. So um, we saw Maeve Dealey go off fairly early on and Vicky Irwin came on to replace her. Um, and then later on in the match, we actually uh, saw Enya Breen pick up a niggle, um, which kind of bothers her for the rest of the match. Um, and she managed to play on there, but I've no doubt that if we did have another back on the bench who could play 12, uh, she would have been replaced because she just didn't seem too comfortable. I, I worry that she might be a, a, an injury concern for this weekend's match. Um, but yeah, it led to loads of major switches around the place. You mentioned we had Molly on the wing at one point. We had Derv on the wing then at a, another stage. Um, Nicole went to nine. Dana came to ten. And just that kind of switching, particularly with someone like Derv on the wing, I'm not sure if that was rehearsed. Um, Molly may have done that before she started a game on the wing before um, but Derv um, was probably only playing and training and practicing with the forwards in the in the lead up and that was just a switch that needed to be made because of injuries and stuff that had happened and so it probably messed up the flow a little bit Derv did really well there don't get me wrong fantastic ball carrier not afraid to step people and try to take them on but was it an ideal situation? No and that's what happens with the 6-2 split it's a risk that you're taking that your backs, um, you know, you want to hope they stay fit and healthy so that you're not missing out on that extra back that you could add. And you mentioned there, it's a risk. Do you think it paid off? Um, no, um, but again, not entirely because of the 6-2 split. The result wasn't what we wanted, um, you know, and I don't know if changing out one of the forwards on the bench uh, for a back that we might have on the bench would have made a massive difference anyway. The The situation the performance that put in while well, was full of heart and passion wasn't just up to the standard and Wales were technically superior and physically dominant the whole game and I don't think we lost the game because of that 6-2 split and Dan O'Brien we obviously did see her come on and in particular she was able to get those longer kicks that we seem to be missing especially in the first half what did you make of her performance when she did come on I thought she did have a, a, a good impact on the game. As you mentioned, we played with the wind uh, in the second half, which is a massive advantage. We we really put ourselves under pressure in the first half when we were against the wind. And then when you don't have someone who has those long range kicks to get you out of trouble and kind of get your exits and, and relieve that pressure, you then tend to have to play more ball in hand. You become more fatigued and therefore you're more likely to make mistakes. And in that Welsh game, we weren't winning collisions, so we could get no front football. We couldn't put Wales under pressure to get them to kind of ease back a little bit. And so we were inviting pressure all the time. Whereas in the second half, with the wind, with someone like Dan O'Brien on, we began to utilise um, her, her left boot a little bit more, put us out of pressure, put the onus on Wales to go back and collect the ball, and we were able to then use our line speed to put them under pressure. And um, look... I think in the first half, we probably didn't use Enya Breen enough as well uh, as a second playmaker and, and someone who has a big boot in her and, and relieve those kicks. But I think when you're playing, you know, on the TV, it looks well and good, you know, that there's a, a wind out there. But until you're playing, you don't actually realise how strong it is and, and how difficult it is to, to kick into those winds. So I thought she did really well. Uh, her movement of the ball was really good. She made some good decisions. Uh, as I mentioned, her kicking out of hand was, was really good. Uh, but you also, I suppose, have to take that with a pinch of salt because Wales really took their foot off the gas in the second half. You know, they made a lot of changes. They were probably very happy with their performance. They had the bonus point by half time. You know, in the second half score, while Ireland was 5-5 and while Ireland did improve in the second half, Wales probably um, eased off a little bit and, and that allowed us to play that easier and simpler brand of rugby. And the possession statistics for the game, you know, from watching, you might have thought... 80-20 maybe to Wales as you said they had the bonus point by half time but that that wasn't the case what was the possession like there? Yeah so um, when I watched the first half look it wasn't the the most um, easiest of viewing I suppose Ireland seemed to be really struggling all the time on the back foot as I mentioned they, they couldn't exit very well so they were running the ball in hand and getting turned over because we weren't winning collisions and we weren't being dominant 
And at halftime, I was really surprised to see the the possession stat- the statistics were much closer. And um, Wales had 52% possession, Ireland had 48 To me, it felt uh, a lot, a lot closer to maybe 80% Wales and 20% Ireland. It just felt like Wales had the ball all the time and we were constantly scrambling. And then even in the second half, when we did have a lot more possession. We just didn't do enough with it. Uh, Wales scored five tries to our one. And, you know, and they were much more astute and, and technical and their their mall really, really destroyed us and it looked like they could score a try at any time. And in the end, uh, Ireland actually ended up having more possession than Wales, but Wales were just more clinical with their executions. And Greg McWilliams after the match said that physicality was going to be a big focus and it was a big problem during the game. Just for people listening, I suppose, what does the solution to that look like? Is it, you know, getting into the gym? Is it bulking up or is it, you know the way Ireland play what what does that actually look like and um, just uh, a little bit of both like so obviously we can't change much in a week to be honest <laughs> uh, some parts of physicality and dominance are mindset our mindset to be able to actually just hit somebody with all your force and f- make sure that you win that game line or you get that tackle down a big thing with Ireland was we were making tackles uh, but we weren't you know, making dominant tackles, so stopping them in their tracks. So Wales were still making gain line and we had to scramble backwards. And, you know, same with our collisions. Wales were winning the collision, so we couldn't get go forward ball. So it made it really easy for them to try and turn over the ball and and put us under pressure. And yeah, look, uh, unfortunately for Ireland, we are a very small pack uh, from a weight advantage um, point of view. We don't have the biggest forwards going and uh, I think in the Wales match, on average, they had a six kilo um, advantage weight advantage per player in the in the pack, which is massive, you know, and and that makes a massive contribution when you're in a scrum or when you're trying to make dominant collisions. They're much bigger players and much harder to bring down. Uh, look, stuff like that from a long term point of view. Yes, we can get stronger and everything else, but a lot of that is a mindset of I'm going to go in there and I'm going to make every tackle and going to bring them to ground with really good technique. You do not have to be the biggest or strongest player to be the best tackler and to to be physically dominant. You have to have a really good technique along with that aggressive mindset. And I caught up with Irish prop Linda Jungang during the week to see how she felt after the match. So, Linda, a very tough game at the weekend. Obviously not the result you would have hoped for. And it was clear from the start that they were very physical. What was it like being in that path? Uh, I mean, it's always an honor to wear the, the green jersey. You know, when you go in, you know what you're going to face um, as an opponent. And and we was definitely physical. And, um, like, it's an honestly credit to the team and their management. They're really part in on Saturday. And we we came in, we gave it all, everything that we really have been working on, you know. And... Mm-hmm things didn't work out the way that we wanted and um, nothing we went all the way well I mean your biggest lesson is your loss so we're hoping that from today um we start moving to all this different scheme like that game's over um we have a massive like things to learn about that game and improve on so um we kind of just putting our head down and focusing on this Saturday as um, we're playing against fans and that's even a bigger challenge. So um, we're really, 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 really looking forward to that. And at halftime, it was 26 nil, And then obviously in the second half, it was just one try each. What was that halftime sort of talk like? How did you go into that second half with a different mindset? Yeah, we, we came in at halftime. We spoke about what we needed to improve on on in the second half and we listened to what the coach could see from the balls and what the other the their remaining squad team could see from their side and we we really it was all about just coming together and playing together and and giving all and enjoying those last um, 40 minutes and to be honest we we had a positive mindset coming back in and and we can only we can only feel myself like we gave so many penalties. So and um, those penalties stopped up from playing or didn't, you know, it was just going with his way in. And so that's not something that we may really need to improve on on all penalty intakes and all set pieces. So it was really the talk to kind of just uh, have time to kind of just go back to more 
much of basics and just play your game. And you mentioned there the penalties. Is there any other areas you'd be looking to focus on going into the next match? I think we really, we really not look forward to just kind of in our game in general. It's just penalty counts and set pieces. Uh, when we working on Saturday, so it's it's a massive area when you talk about rugby and like set piece, it weren't weren't really unfortunate, and I think that's something that I know breakdown. That's something that we that really didn't help us on Saturday, and something that we can only fix ourselves, you know. And and as a player, we didn't really do that, so we have a big work on to do as management on players and. Um, ahead of Saturday against Fastest, that's even a bigger challenge for us. So Hannah, Linda there speaking obviously after the game, what do you make of her mindset now, you know, heading into round two of the Six Nations? Yeah, look, I think she's really, uh, you know, right to be looking ahead and focusing on this France game. So that Wales game is gone. It didn't go the way they wanted, you know, um, but what they need to do is they need to be able to take the learnings from that, focus on the areas they want to improve, um, and then, you know, start to focus on France a little bit more and how they can use those learnings and turn them into positives, um, you know, for this French game. And it can be hard to park that defeat, particularly maybe when the girls, you know, were really going in hoping for that win and then it doesn't turn out the way you want to. But that's what the best players do. They, they're able to park those performances and those defeats take those learnings from them and, and turn them into those positives and use it as a driving force for this French game, which, as Linda mentioned, is an even bigger challenge than this Welsh team that we saw. They're even more physically dominant. They are a much bigger pact and they have some unbelievable uh, players in the back line that can do an awful lot of damage, you know, if you don't uh, shut them down fairly quickly. And a big problem for Ireland last week outside of their physical dominance was that we just missed too many first up tackles. And if you give this French team some space or allow them to break tackles, they could easily put a lot of points on you. And uh, Ireland be looking to go out uh, with a point to prove, you know, playing as a team, playing with some consistency and just trying to do something with the possession that they had. You are watching the Her Sports Six Nation show brought to you in association with Opal a proud sponsor of Irish Rugby. So in Sevens news then, the IRFU has announced that Aidan McNulty has left his position as Ireland Women's Sevens head coach with Alan Temple-Jones appointed to the role ahead of this weekend's tournament in Hong Kong. McNulty has taken up the position of provincial talent coach at Munster. So Temple-Jones was previously head of the athletic performance for the Ireland Sevens programme and returns having spent the last two seasons with the Sharks in South Africa. Hannah, what's your thoughts on this? And I suppose bring us a bit more up to date in what's happening with Sevens. Yeah, so look, I mentioned last week, obviously, that, um, you know, while the Sevens are an absolute massive loss uh, to this year's Six Nations squad, that they're off doing something that they are have been focused on for the last number of years, and, and that's trying to qualify for the Paris 2024 Olympics. And this sevens team is the closest that any sevens team has been before. And they play in uh, Hong Kong this weekend. It's the uh, second last round of the series. And, and basically the top four in the World Series qualify automatically for the Olympics. And um, having been part of the seven squad for the last two uh, Olympic cycles where we failed to qualify for both Rio and Tokyo, um, I completely understand the situation that's going on there and the decision to prioritise these sevens players with this sevens tournament. We will never have a better chance uh, than we do now to qualify for the Olympics. Ireland are currently sitting in fifth um, with France ahead of them who are obviously hosts and automatically qualified. So Ireland are currently, if the World Series was to end today, they would qualify for the Olympics. And this tournament this weekend is absolutely crucial for them to... Um, get some more points on the board. They're currently 10 points ahead of Fiji in sixth and they have Fiji in their pool group uh, this weekend and so it's massively vital for them to put in a big performance. In terms of coaching structure, um, Aidan McNulty came in on the back of um, Anthony Eddy's departure which had its own for in Irish rugby and he actually did a really good job in, in bringing these seven uh, girls together and, and really bringing about a really good culture within the group um, and 
basically getting them to work hard for each other because sevens is all about uh, teamwork and that, you know, all you need is for one person to slip up and the other team more than likely scores a try, you know, and he he just got this team working really, really well together for each other and their their defence massively improved um, and, and he put them in a really good position and like while his coaching and, and everything that he was doing off the field was really working, it was the players themselves that had to buy into this and who had to put out these performances and it's been fantastic to watch them doing so well. Um, this changeover for me came as a surprise because I thought Aidan McNulty was doing really well but obviously you know people in the RFU have a much bigger insight uh, than I do but the um, appointment of Alan Temple-Jones is massive and uh, no disrespect to Aidan McNulty but for me is is uh, a step up in coaching in terms of experience of sevens and everything else so Alan Temple-Jones was involved with South African men's seven team for 10 years and he was their head defensive coach as well and he li- he brings a wealth of experience um, and talent uh, to this women's team that you know is unrivaled in many coaches across the globe and, and he was with us before as a, a S&C head coach um, but for these girls going into these two rounds where it's a massive massive uh, prospect for them and, and they're right there he will bring a massive level of intensity uh, their defence will only improve and I think he is good enough uh, to be able to help those girls get the job done and I'm really excited for his appointment not just for obviously the the rest of this year but leading it to Paris 2024 where I reckon if, if he can bring them to the heights of these broad other teams that we could potentially medal at an Olympics let alone just You are watching the Her Sport Six Nations show brought to you in association with Opal a proud sponsor of Irish Rugby. So in terms of the other matches then, I suppose the bigger one, the bigger difference, England and Scotland, we kind of knew what the result was going to be. 58-7, I think you said it might be a little closer, but what did you make of the match? Yeah, look, uh, no surprise here to see that England utterly dominated. Um, you know, they've been dominating the Six Nations for the last number of years, you know, and, and no surprise here. Um England are just ruthless. The depth that they have in their squad is absolutely amazing and unrivaled with any other team in the world. And the ability to be able to replace players, you know, with injury with other players and they step in seamlessly like nothing has ever changed it is phenomenal. And they ran in 10 tries at the weekend. They probably could have had an awful lot more. And, you know, uh, just they have players of extreme and world-class calibre in every single position. And unfortunately, Scotland just could not handle them at the weekend. And yes, Scotland were missing a couple of players who were away playing with uh, GB7s this weekend in Hong Kong. And and that's a big loss for them. But uh, even with those players, you know, had Scotland have had them, I think England would have easily ran in, you know, the, the tries that they did. And like Marley Packer got a hat-trick, Sadia Kabea who I name-checked last week, a massively explosive player. She got her own try and she broke the most tackle of the weekend. She she beat 10 players, um, really, really powerful. Claudia McDonald had try of the of the weekend, potentially try of the tournament where she ran through about six players from inside her own half. And they just have players all over the park who are capable of producing moments of magic and they are going to be very, very difficult to stop this tournament. And a game then that was a lot closer than we would have thought. Italy and France, 12-22 was the final score there, obviously, to France. What did you make of that? And I suppose specifically, um, what did you make of Italy's performance? Yeah, look, obviously, uh, France are notoriously slow starters um, and nothing new here. They've made a lot of changes, a lot of retirements to their squad and they still have some really, really good players. Um, but probably just not the best performance from them. I'm not going to read into it too much with them. I think that they'll only improve and grow as the tournament. So you think it was a once-off sort of? A little bit. Look, I think Italy's performance was really good. And, you know, France would definitely be looking at that and, and hoping for an awful lot of improvements. Uh, the second half was dominated with some awful weather, which definitely uh, had an impact on, on the play. Um, but I thought Italy put in a really good performance. They almost surprised me, but I mentioned before, the, the problem or the issue uh, and the frustrations I have with Italy is that uh, they're not consistent, you know, and they could put in this brilliant performance like they did against France and score a couple of tries uh, and then they could go out in the next game and they could be all over the place and, and a completely different team than you saw 
uh, than the week before. And so what I'm really hoping for Italy is that they can back this up and put in some uh, big performances. It would be great to see them grow throughout this tournament. Uh, but I only expect France to improve and get better. And, and the big showdown for me still is that France-England game uh, a couple of weeks away. So before we head into the final part of the show, we have our new segment, obviously, which is called Break It Down. We're giving Hannah 60 seconds to explain rugby terminology. So this week, we're going to be talking about the 50-22. So Hannah, let's break it down. Okay, so the 50-22 was brought in by World Rugby to try and make the game a little bit more exciting and increase, I suppose, line breaks in the game. So normally, if you kick the ball uh, out of your own hand and it bounces and goes out, the other team gets possession of it. However, the 50-22 law was brought in as a trial initially where if you kick the ball from within your own half um, and it bounces and goes out inside the opposition's 22, you get to keep possession. And so it's trying to entice teams to uh, kick the ball a little bit more and play more attacking rugby and take the risk of getting that uh, 50-22 and possession back in opponent's territory. But what it does to defences is if you know the ball's going to be kicked a little bit more and, and risk losing possession, you'll put more people in the backfield. And by putting more people in the backfield, it leaves more people um, in the front line or less people in the front line. And then there's more line breaks on. 60 seconds Ooh. exactly there. So we had rooks last week and now the 50-22. So by the end of it, there'll be experts, I'd say. I don't know. I'd still consult an actual referee or someone else. I'm not perfect. When speaking to Linda, I also asked her how the team was feeling ahead of round two of the championship and what this week looks like for them as they prepare to take on France. And can you talk me a bit through what this week ahead looks like for you as you prepare for that game against France? Um. It's not like other, like this week is not a different to how we've been preparing for all the incidents. We do our video analysis and we have all installs and we have the, the leadership team we we'll have. We have, a new, we have a meeting and talk about what we needed to do, what we need to, to improve on. And the management will come in with their feedback as so as players. And it's not a different to what we, we're not used to, it's just really watching the game back and doing our video analysis and trying to really implement what we needed to change um, on the training pace so that we can implement that on Saturday. And it's obviously a home game down in Cork. What difference does that, does that make to you as a team playing? I mean, it's a massive home game, it's a massive, um, all this like to to your team, right? There's nothing better than playing on your home page with your family and friends and your community there. And think that is so important. Um, so we we can we can see that in on last Saturday Wales that they they had that you know, and that just gives you a strip boost. And and home games are massive. They're massive um for for you. So I think that would be it's always nice to play at home, especially in Cork and in most great park and we have such a good six nation there last year so we want to kind of make that continue on that pathway so and um, we're really looking forward to saturday and to be honest we we're not out of the competition and um, so we really want to go back into the competition so we we're looking forward to it and you mentioned earlier you know playing that basic rugby what twos are able to play what would your overall other hopes be for the campaign? What would you like to get out of this? I think we have so many um, young players coming through and everything. So we want to really uh, set a platform for them to kind of play their rugby. And we then we want to, we want to, we want to come, we want to win games. I think that's the goal. We want to win games, we want to showcase what, oh, what we can do and what all broke me, you know, and I think that's what we're working toward that path, you know, and that's really like we're talking about coming third uh, for the Six Nation, that's the goal of a whole team and a management, management and everyone, everyone going to that game on Saturday, we have, we want to play and give it all to their country. And like I said, it's always an honor to put on that jersey. So 
everyone will feel that pride that is in our DNA and you know we we don't give up we we're fighters and that's really what the green jersey is about you know um we we, we just want to win games and we can, i can't say anymore because honestly every game you you want to go in you don't really think about the end for you don't think about the winning the tournament or what what comes after that i think right now we're just trying to focus on each game at a time and the next game is fine, so we want to really give out everything on um, Saturday. Brilliant, Linda. Thanks so much for talking to me, and best of luck at the weekend. Thank you very much. She says something really interesting there. She says, you know, we're not out of the competition. It's obviously a home game for Ireland this weekend, but we are against one of the better teams in the Six Nations. What do you think this weekend's match is going to look like? Yeah, look, I, I agree with Linda. Like, there's only been one game. You still four more games, you know, to potentially go on and win the, the competition. I admire her for saying that and her belief and desire to want to win. Um, do I think that's achievable? No. Look, I don't think we're at the standard required to win the Six Nations. Uh, this weekend's game against France will be a massive test and a massive challenge. And, you know, I think it could be a really difficult day for Ireland. But what I want to see is for is just small improvements and that's all you can ask of this team can they take some learnings from last week's game and turn them into improvements for this game against France we know they're going to be physically dominant we know they're going to be aggressive and try to get up on our faces and they will punish us for our mistakes so can we keep our mistakes to a, a, a minimum can we keep our penalty count and have really good discipline and not give France easy opportunities you know and can we look at the France Italy game and see what Italy did to try and upset and poor France a little bit and can we model our game and our, our tactics to suit us in that, you know, and, and try just make it very, very difficult for France on the day and any points that they scored, they had to work really hard for it. And you'd imagine Ireland would want to do more with any possession that they do get, considering they obviously didn't make that many opportunities for themselves last week. Yeah, absolutely. And again, like when you have possession, that's all well and good, but you need to be able to do something with it if you want to win the game. And unfortunately, Ireland didn't really execute and we didn't have many opportunities and playing the ball in the Welsh half for very long. And so that's what we need to do with our carries. We need to try and make gain line. We need to get this French defence scrambling. You know, if they give away any penalties, can we move the ball up the field and, and work our set pieces in order to get into a good position to score? You know, and, and that's something that I hope to see this weekend. Um, and I hope that our leaders on the pitch step up and make those really good decisions to get us into positions where we can take some points. And would you like to see any changes in terms of that starting team? Um, look, uh, I think there will be changes. Um, I'm not quite sure where. It wouldn't surprise me if they maybe brought Cy McGrath off the bench for this one and maybe started Christy Haney instead, who just brings that calmness and that experience and that leadership that we need. And maybe we're lacking a little bit um, the last day. You know, it, it depends on Andy Breen's injury. Will we see a, a replacement there? Um It'll be interesting to see what they do with the backs. So they stick with that 6-2 split because of the the physicality the French will bring or will they go back to a more versatile and widely used 5-3? Um, and again, will De Dervlick of Ard start? I think she should, but where do you put her? It's a predicament and, you know, uh, I think she needs to go somewhere, but where is the issue? And I'm, I'm not quite sure. And what do you think... Greg McWilliams' approach will be, you know, he said ahead of the last match, we'll know where we are after this game. And we obviously know that now. And it's kind of a case of where do we go from here? What do you think he will be looking to, to kind of do differently this weekend? Yeah, look, I think he'll be under no illusions. Is this going to be a tough game and a tough ask? And that getting a result in this will be an, a, a, one of the greatest results Ireland would have ever gotten in the Six Nations but uh, I think he'll be just looking to try and maintain possession and again do something with that possession and um, trying to keep that discipline down our penalty count was very high last week you know and trying to have our, our bench again make that big impact in, in the closing moments of the game and if you had to put a scoreline on it what would you say? I don't think we want to because I think that says take, enough maybe it will be pretty and for Scotland and Wales do you think that will be a tightly contested affair or will Wales now, will we see the kind of start of their new journey as a domination team? Yeah, look, I was really impressed with Wales and, and look, I want to reiterate that 
while that result against Ireland last weekend came as maybe a shock for Ireland, and it wasn't just that Ireland didn't have their best game, it's that Wales were drastically, drastically improved. And, you know, and I think they're going to be a force to be reckoned with. And I, I, I think they'll actually come third in this competition and give France and England a little bit of a scare. I, I think they'll win against Scotland easily, but this is always a fierce rivalry between those two. And, you know, but I think Wales will have a little bit too much for them. And I'm, I'm guessing it'll be around 35-10 or 35-15 to Wales. And then we have England and Italy on the Sunday Italy put it up to France last week. Do you think we'll see the same this weekend? Yeah, look, I think Italy will be fierce competitors, uh, but will they be at the standard required to beat England? Absolutely not. England are on a, a world record 20-game unbeaten streak, which is unheard of. And, you know, I've no doubt they're going to make it 21 the weekend. Their current holder is their strength and depth. I think they'll make a couple of changes to give their squad a run out, but uh, I still think the result will be the same and it'll be, a, again, a 30-point margin between the teams minimum. And on to possibly the most important team, the fantasy rugby team. So how did you get on last week? Yeah, I think I did all right. I was a little bit rushed in my changes. Um, I I left a little bit too late and my budget was all out of sorts. But I thankfully had Marley Packer in my squad. I had Claudia McDonald in my squad. Um, you know, I did put Side McGrath in there. She did all right for me, um, which I was pretty happy about. And um, I had Gabrielle Verney. I couldn't leave her and she scored me a try. So I was very happy. And if you haven't joined Her Sports League, be sure to do so using the league number on our social channels. But as for this week, who should people be looking to have on their team? Um, Well, I very silly um, put a lot of Irish players in last weekend and put very little Welsh players in and haven't looked at how good the Welsh were. Uh, I'll definitely be putting in a couple of them today. Their front row of Pyres, Jones and Tupelozu will probably be my front row this weekend. I thought they were fantastic. So I'll be putting them in, uh, keeping Packer, keeping Vernier, putting in Bougiard of France. I think she's going to have a big game and uh, putting in Giada Franco of Italy, who was fantastic and is back from injury for them. So be sure to join our league if you haven't done so yet. Make sure also to follow along with the Ireland and France game this Saturday at quarter past three, the Scotland and Wales game at half five and the England and Italy game on Sunday at three o'clock. That's all from us today. Thank you for watching and listening and we'll catch you next week for a recap and preview ahead. That's all from us today. Thank you for watching and we'll catch you next week for a recap and preview of the match ahead.